thanks very much for uh, joining us tonight um, as we explore all sorts of avenues of charter boat ownership, what it means, uh, what's happening in the market at the moment, and the opportunities that can really help you get on the water and go cruising. But before we get into it, just a little bit about me. Uh, so I've spent, well, this year will be my 17th consecutive year um, doing the various boat shows around Australia and promoting a number of brands, uh, including Seawind. And over the years, I've had, from a very young age, as shown in the top right-hand corner, uh, grew up on my uncle's uh, and my, my family's yachts, uh, which happened to be one of the earliest bare boat charter boats in Australia. So I've gotten to know the charter industry from about four or five years of age and, uh, and had various uh, involvements with it over the years through uh, anything from selling ferry ticket sales at a marina in Queensland through to selling uh, multi-million dollar boats into charter operations in uh, in Australia, Asia, and the Caribbean. And um, as far as Australia goes, I've, I've probably, fair to say, I've got the record for probably more production catamarans placed in the charter than, than I dare say anyone, um, partly thanks to my amount of time in the industry. So I want to share some of that knowledge with you tonight and uh, and show you uh, what's really happening in the market right now because it's it's a really interesting time um, to uh, to potentially be involved so tonight we're going to look at how charter boat ownership can help fund a sabbatical and that is taking time out going cruising we're going to have a look at the various charter models and look at a few profit and loss examples in various locations around Australia. And I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot on what's happening, particularly in the Sundays at the moment, but also other parts of the country, uh, following a recent trip where I surveyed all the major charter companies and some major um, tourism operators and also a bit of an overview of what's actually happening in Australia's tourism industry right now and uh, and how that can be led to our advantage. So some of the common problems that I see from customers that I come across year after year at boat shows who can't quite get on the water and make the reality, make the dream of going cruising a reality. And they're fairly common, fairly obvious, just can't justify spending the money to get a, a decent size or a, a decent quality boat. Um, and as a result, cruising seems like something that's years and years away. And even convincing family members that this is a good idea and a responsible financial idea is sometimes a challenge. And these problems result in the number one myth, and that's cruising is just for retirees. And what I've discovered over the years is that that is absolute nonsense. <clears throat> and that's where sabbaticals comes in. Because what I see in many parts of the world, particularly Europeans, is that cruising is not just for the retired folk. It's for people that can structure their lives in such a way to take time out and, and make it possible while they're still working and while they're fit and able to take on the physical demands that cruising sometimes throws at you. And so a sabbatical is actually taking planned, structured time out of, of your working life to essentially hit the water and uh, pursue paradise. 
but doing it before you retire, before you get restricted by the challenges of age. And what I've noticed interviewing dozens of boat owners around the world, Australians, New Zealanders, Americans, Europeans, is that taking this structured time out can completely re-energize someone's life. You can be the best at what you do and super successful, but you can still get bored, burnt out and disconnected from loved ones. So it's an opportunity to, to escape and come back and hit the ground running bigger and better. So I think it's important just to put charter boat ownership into a little bit of context to sabbaticals. And this is a way that we're now approaching some of the benefits that charter boat ownership can bring to apply it to the ultimate goal of going cruising. And that's how we've essentially extracted a formula, which is our five waypoints to paradise. And it's a process that's been extracted from a whole bunch of boat owners on how to allow cruising before you retired possible for virtually anyone, regardless of their experience, providing they've got enough margin in their life to make this possible financially. And those points are planning your course, so you pick out a big, hairy, audacious goal to go cruising. And that could be circumnavigating Australia, it could be cruising out to the Pacific Islands, it could be going further, it could be going closer to home, it could be just East Coast Australia to the Whitsundays, very popular route, or even inshore. But whatever it is, planning to purchase a boat that's fit for that purpose, not just a boat that's pretty or maybe suitable for the short-term use. And then applying that boat through a charter model that you can profit from and effectively fund that program. And during the course of running a boat through a charter program over the over a number of years, three, four, five years or more, take the time to prepare your boat, prepare yourself in terms of getting skilled up on that boat and skilled in other areas, whether it's sailing or mechanical, whatever it might be, and also introducing your family to the concept of cruising and getting them used to a bit of life on the water rather than hitting it all in one big go, which can sometimes backfire. And then eventually prospering from the benefits that a sabbatical can bring, but also having an exit strategy to sell your boat efficiently. So we're going to have an opportunity to delve into those other areas later on. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as the night proceeds. But tonight, we're going to look at number three, and that's using charter to, to earn a profit and effectively fund the dream of boat ownership. So why charter boat ownership? Why bother? Why put your boat with someone else to, to run? Why have other people use your boat? Why risk it? These are common questions that get asked to me. And it comes down to these four main points. It allows you to get a boat immediately rather than four, five, ten years down the track. And the importance of that is that you're using your boat immediately as well as other people. And the time that you're spending on your boat is... Uh, concentrated quality time because it's with a charter boat company and the charter boat operator manages all aspects of the boat and so that gives you the uh, best quality of time on board the boat rather than spending all that time maintaining the boat which is as anyone that would 
know who's owned a boat uh, can often take up far more time than actually using the boat. And obviously having the financial assistance there of other people using your boat and paying the bills. Imagine that. I mean, people pay your maintenance and financial costs of you ultimately owning a boat to go cruising on. And in the meantime, it's in an awesome location, whether it's the Whitsundays, Sydney, Pitwater, Moreton Bay, Tonga, Thailand, New Zealand, Caribbean, you name it. There's extraordinary locations. And that's by default because they're the locations that help sell charter holidays. And if anyone's unclear of what charter is, it's, it's obviously when someone pays to go on a boat and there's a financial return to the boat owner. And we'll go through a few different models of boat ownership. And the four most common models that we see in Australia, at least, are the bare boat fleets in the Whitsundays. And that's where a boat is operated by its by the, uh, the charterer itself without a skipper on board. And they might take it out for a week to go cruising around the islands of the Whitsundays uh, with daily skeds or scheduled um, call-ins from the charter operator or the charter company so they can give advice on where to go the next day and make sure they're all tied up well at night. Then there's another form of charter boat ownership run through a club membership style fleet. And that's where a single owner will have a boat, uh, much like a bare boat. So there's a single boat owner investor and then the charter operator will go out and sell membership subscriptions for a year to that boat. So rather than selling individual week holidays or a few day holidays, there'll be a year subscription. And we'll look at the pros and cons of that shortly. Then you have your local fleets, locations like Sydney Harbour, Pittwater, uh, Moreton Bay and Brisbane and others around the country uh, that are smaller fleets but closer to the, the main populace and often closer to where people live who own the boats. And then finally, there's the owner operator, the do-it-yourself operator. And that's when not only do you own the boat, but you manage all aspects of the boat from marketing, skippering, detailing, maintenance, the whole works. So when thinking about what's the best model to consider when placing a boat in charter, this is a, a pretty simple way of looking at it. On the left-hand side, we have revenue at its highest with, with Sunday bear boating fleets, and that's because they've got the lion's share of that market. And they're very well established, and people are booking boats for a minimum of five days and often up to a week or even two weeks. Club membership, because it's often closer to the boat owner, allows you more time on the boat rather than the Whitsundays where it might be far away from the boat owner and therefore less time. So with a club membership program, you might get a little bit more time on the boat, but the revenue is not as strong. And you'll notice those two categories fall under negative gearing options. And that's largely because their revenue is strong enough to handle the losses that negative gearing can bring through offset depreciation. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Further to our right, we have the local metro fleets. And again, revenues slightly less, but again, the personal use is high because the boat's local and it's quite seasonal. So you can have a lot of time to use the boat. And finally, to the right hand side, your owner DIY can get as much time as they like on the boat, 365 days a year, in fact. But at least initially, 
the revenue stream is a bit hit and miss because until you get that business established, your revenue and profit might be a little bit lighter on that, what it would be in a more established charter operator. So both of those models fall under what's called a hobby-based business model. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. So I want to show you here one example of a, a charter boat going into a Whitsunday bear boat fleet and what you might expect from that in terms of return on investment situation and also personal days on the boat. So this is based on a Seawind 1160 light catamaran, very popular uh, charter and cruising catamaran. And you're probably up for about 600 grand thereabouts for about going into a fleet. Your personal use days in the Whit Sundays would be about three weeks plus unlimited standby. So you're encouraged to, to book three weeks in advance during the year. And if it's not being used and you can get up there in the short term, you can use more. Then we have our charter income. So that's our gross income. And the variable costs that vary depending on how many charters are booked, including the management fee that the charter company takes, and then holding costs further down the list. And that gives you ultimately a net return of about 9% on that investment. So these figures are based on, I guess, an average of all the figures that we've seen from multiple charter companies in the Whitsundays uh, provided to us within the last few months. So it's quite current. If we have a look at a club membership style boat, it's, it's similar. However, the charter income's a bit lighter on and management fees are slightly higher just because of the structure of that business model. And the marina fees are a bit higher also because the boat would, well, in this case, would be based in Sydney. So there's slightly higher costs. So your return on investment's a bit lower, about 6%. But your personal use days are a bit higher, around 72 days or more per year, depending on how many of the memberships are pre-sold. A local metro fleet would see charter income around 85 grand a year, netting you about 18 grand or 3% return. And the personal use days from that over 100 days, because you've got virtually unlimited standby access to the boat. And it's close, often to where people live. And finally, the DIY owner operator, same boat, charter income, we've estimated a bit less until they get operating. Uh, the boat would be located locally, but because you're taking on some of the own uh, management fees and cleaning and briefing fees, uh, actually we've left cleaning fees in there, but no need for briefing fees and whatnot. Um, the costs are a little bit lower, but bringing in around 3% as well. And unlimited personal use days. But of course, you've got to have the time yourself to do it. So that's probably suiting someone looking for a, a complete sea change in a business, uh, a new business venture. So there's another model that's worth exploring also. And that's if you combine two charter models, whereby we have a boat operating in more than one peak season. And so we have a number of boats, and this is based on some of our customers that have done this very program, whereby they'll leave a boat in the Sundays over winter, which is their peak season, and then bring it down south to Sydney over summer, or it could be Brisbane. And this is actually following the trend of much larger, more professional charter boat operators uh, that are chasing you know, the real strong return on investments. The additional benefits of this is it gives you lots of personal use if you can spare a bit of time to join the delivery trips 
between the Whit Sundays and Sydney. And obviously, as a result of that, if you're joining either with a skipper, and once you've got a bit of experience uh, skippering the boat yourself, you're really building up your sea time and working towards a larger cruising adventure. And so you're getting a little bit of the best of both worlds from this, where you're getting higher revenue again and good, respectable personal use out of the boat too. And, and you can definitely negative gear the boat if that's something you wanted to do. So like we said, time on Sydney Harbour, if that's where you happen to live, three weeks a year in the Whit Sundays, and four weeks a year moving the boat back and forth, usually with a professional skipper, until you had the confidence to do it yourself, if you had the time, of course. And so when we look at the combined model, this is what it looks like. So a number of the expenses are shared amongst both locations. And the seasons give you good revenue from both locations. So it brings up your return on investment to a solid 11%. On top of that, you're getting at least 76 days personal use on board the boat each year. So another way of looking at what's possible. And so let's have a look at what this means in terms of the actual cost of boat ownership. So if we're looking at a Seawind 1160 light, where we have a peak season of the Whitsundays, a peak season in Sydney, two weeks delivering the boat north and two weeks south, and financing 60% of the boat over five years. This is what it looks like. So you're required to put down 240 grand, that's a 40% deposit, financing the rest. Now that finance has a 40% balloon payment after five years. Then you have monthly repayments of about $5,200 a month. However, that's offset by your average monthly income of about $5,400, giving you a monthly windfall of $200 a month. Now, this can fluctuate a little bit, of course, because not every month you're going to have strong income, particularly the months where you're moving the boat back and forth. However, that's what we'd expect over the course of a year. So at the end of the five years, Let's have a, a look at a snapshot scenario of where you're sitting. So you've put 240 grand in. That $200 a month has grown into 12 grand over five years as a windfall. You've had to pay out the 40% balloon payment after five years. So the total cost of the boat has worked out to be 372 grand. So that's an ultimate saving of $228,000 which is nothing to be sneezed at. And of course, there's been some market appreciation in that, but you've been using the boat. You've been getting experience on the boat and you've been pre pre preparing the boat to go cruising. And that's before we even look at what negative gearing options there are. And this is really something you need to have a closer look at with a specialized accountant. Um, but in general terms, you have up to 30% depreciation available that you can offset against other forms of income. Now that's really applicable if you can prove there's a prospect of profit. And what that means is over the course of the life of the charter boat, and if we're looking at five years, the losses that you incur against the boat in terms of depreciation need to be regained through profits and then, and then some in terms of breaking through into the black and giving you an overall accumulated profit. And the example that we just went through well and truly does that scenario. So <clears throat> with some advice from an accountant, you might find you're in a position to take advantage of that. 
and we can put you in touch with accountants that specialize in charter boats operating in the Sundays and other parts of Australia. And I would advise to do that because not every accountant is, is aware of the hoops and hurdles that the ATO requires someone to go through if they choose to depreciate their boat. So it's important to get the right advice rather than some general advice. And often accountants don't look at boats um, the same way they'd look at other investments and nor should they. Because ultimately as a typical investment up against shares or property uh, probably doesn't really stack up because it's a depreciating asset. But if you've got a greater plan in mind, it makes perfect sense because it's a very economical means of getting that boat. The other way of looking at depreciation is through a hobby based business model. So that's usually applied when the income is, is much lower. And so effectively, you can claim losses, depreciation losses against the boat, but it's quarantined to the profits generated from the boat itself. So if you've got very low income or medium income, but unlikely to generate enough profits to put you back in the black in the long term by offsetting tax costs against other forms of income, well then just quarantine it to the income on the boat itself. So that suits DIY boat owners often if they're just happy to pay some expenses and get some pocket money out of it. What is interesting though, is that GST is refundable on both models because they're both businesses. It's just one's uh, really going for it and the other is a little more geared back. So, and that GST is a liability that sits on the boat during its life in charter. And once it finishes charter, you'd be expected to either pay the GST back on whatever the market value of the boat is at the time, or if it was sold, it would, could be sold as a going concern. So that GST liability just shifts to the next buyer of the boat or the next owner. So I want to give you a little case study here because it probably doesn't mean much if um, no one else is doing this. But essentially what, we've, what we're presenting here is examples based on what other people have done and essentially given us the idea in the first place. So the Bargetts family owned, uh, currently own a C-1116, but they started with a smaller boat, a C-1000, that was operated in charter in the wet Sundays. They then upgraded to a bigger boat, the 1160. And then after having that boat in charter in the wet Sundays for a few years, and also doing a bit of cruising up and down the coast to Brisbane, they took the boat out of charter and they spent 12 months circumnavigating Australia with their two young boys, Stevie and Lockie. They even got on Channel 9 recently uh, for, for this uh, adventure that they had and an incredible life-changing experience for them. So it shows you what can be done and it's a great example. And I'd recommend you uh, check out their blog site too. They've got some great information there on where they went and how they did it. And something that Craig said to me when I was interviewing him is, you know, around cruising, you always hear that I wish I'd gone cruising earlier. Or I wish I was younger. You never hear people say, I wish I'd never gone cruising. So that's just a little interesting insight. So let's take a look at the charter boat market in general. And this is information given to me just recently from all the major charter companies in the Whitsundays. So currently there's about 130 bear boats operating in the Whitsundays. We're just gonna look at the Whitsundays for the moment. 51% of these boats are sailing catamarans. And that's been a pretty significant change over the last 10 years where there was far more mono yachts than sailing cats. But that's been a big shift and what's interesting is that the strongest returns, the strongest income 
it's being felt on power cap brands. And I wouldn't be surprised if over the next five years or so, the power cats might even end up dominating. Partly because it really opens the market up to people that don't have the experience in sailing or just not interested. But it gives the great space and livability and comfort and stability that a catamaran offers, which is why they've been so popular for both experienced cruising people and complete novices that uh, sometimes charter boats. But what was interesting is that the capacity of the fleets, and this is in terms of boats operating in the charter fleet compared to what could be operating or what has been operating, say 10 years ago, is about 50% capacity. So the fleets are way down on the number of boats that they have operating in their charter businesses. And the fleets are aging. Most of the boats up there are five years or older, some 10 years. And so that brings with, with them lots of maintenance costs. And they're just not as an attractive boat to sell as a charter holiday. They're older, you know, they're, they're just uh, not in vogue. So as we mentioned, not only are power cats uh, strong at the moment with resale, but a very fast growing segment, full stop. But what's behind what's happening up there? Well, if we go back to the last few years, probably the last seven years, since the GFC really hit, there's been a massive downturn in boats going into charter. And that's because the tourism industry is so closely linked with the Australian dollar value. So when the dollar went up over parity, domestic tourism become very hard to sell and everyone went overseas for the holidays, just like I did. I went on a number of holidays overseas because they're so damn cheap. And during that time, uh, a number of boats exited the charter operations and the fleets become diminished. But that's changed. The dollar has fallen considerably. And as the little graph here shows, we're down around the low 70s to mid 70 cents mark from over a dollar and five a few years ago. And that's really kicked some gas into the uh, tourism industry, particularly in Queensland and Sydney Harbour. And it's a double whammy because not only are Australians taking holidays in Australia again, but we've also become an internationally uh, attractive and competitive tourism market once again. And from what the charter companies are telling me is that they've seen a 40% increase on sales from just over 12 to 18 months ago. And the prices that they're um, charging for their holidays has increased by 15%. And that's really through not having the discount to sell their charter holidays. So they're really on the start of a new J curve upswing. And as I mentioned, during the last five, seven years, lots of resorts, you know, that this is not just isolated to charter boats, but lots of tourism resorts closed in Queensland. And, you know, I've been pretty heavily involved in um, Queensland tourism over the years. Resorts like Great Keppel Island, Long Island, Lindemann Island, South Mole, Dunk, Brampton, the list goes on. Uh, how many resorts have been closed during to, to tough economical times. And equally, this is when the charter boats left. However, as we can see in this little news clip, clipping here from the Brisbane Times, there's money being spent back on the Australian tourism industry. And the real opportunity is that as this money gets spent to bring resorts back to life, the charter companies can get up and running 
much much faster because a boat you know you can build a brand new boat within a few months and have it operating in the wit sundays so i think there's going to be a real gap in the market over the next few years as the money starts trickling back to restore some of these resorts and so just like Lindemann Island here, where there's 600 mil being spent by Chinese investors, we'll see this happen all the way around the Queensland coast again. But it's gonna take time. And these are just some comments from some local movers and shakers in the Queensland tourism industry. Um, Simon Gra there from CEO of Accor Australia, the largest uh, holiday network, well, largest Accommodation Network in Australia uh, confirms that uh, their visitor rates is largely linked to the Australian dollar and now it's keeping Australians at home. Glenn Burke, CEO of Hamilton Island, met with, with us recently and told us he's booked out for months. They're an absolutely prime position to be taking advantage of the current tourism industry circumstances and as the tourism minister noted uh, that there needs to be serious investment into the tourism industry and they're hoping to get 34,000 new hotel rooms built in the coming years that's enormous so this is a, a, a big trend that we're going to see play out over the next couple of years and that's why the timing is extremely good at the moment to do something about this and to get invested in the tourism industry, particularly if you can make something of it to do something better for yourself in terms of going cruising. Not only have interest rates the lowest they've been forever, um, we've seen what the Aussie dollar is doing and what that's also doing is increasing the the resale of boats as well as new boats increase in price the high demand for charter boats continues and the char charter companies just can't keep up and they're out there buying boats themselves we have a marina in sydney harbour for example that's had uh, we've gone from two charter boats to I think seven or eight charter boats operating there now just in the last couple of years so if you're sick of seeing this all day <laughs> which I am and you prefer to see a bit of this or you find yourself staring out at the window when you should be doing something more like this have a good think about whether a charter boat plan could work for you. And this is the next step that we look at where we quote up a boat, we talk to a charter company that will be eager to take that boat, we put you in touch with an expert accountant that can analyze the whole scenario for you and we package some boat finance and we bring those four elements together to make it a possibility for you. So that's our process or certainly an important element of making a sabbatical a reality. So my contact details are there if you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but also save the date of a major event that we've got coming up in Brisbane soon. On the 18th and 19th of June, we'll be hosting the, the first sabbatical summit. We'll have five guest speakers talk about those five big topics around planning, purchasing, profiting from charter boat ownership, preparing and skilling up, and ultimately prospering and selling on from your charter, from your sabbatical experience. And the next day, we'll be running uh, sea trials on boats. So on one weekend, you can get inspired, educated, and experienced on a boat to really help you get some some knowledge effectively. So that's all from me tonight, folks. Um, so I'm just going to open up to see if there's any questions that I haven't quite 
answered uh, through my presentation or if there's something uh, that you want me to explain a little bit further. So again, if you wanted to put down any questions in the chat dialogue, happy to uh, answer those right now. Have any questions out there? All clear? Clear as mud? Okay, folks. Well, listen, I'll stay on the line for a little bit longer. Um, this presentation has been recorded and will be available on YouTube to watch shortly and if there's uh, anything else I can help you with I'll I'll stand by for a few more minutes we have a question there depreciation over time from Steve that's a good question so uh, so we're looking at two types of depreciation I guess so we have market depreciation which is just the market value of your boat uh, but when often depreciation is referred to in charter boat terms, that's uh, written down value depreciation. Now, the 30% that's applied is on a diminishing scale. In fact, in the first year, they apply up to 15% because they assume it's a part year. And then after that, it's 30% on a diminishing program. So certainly the first few years, are very heavy with depreciation and then it slows down a little bit after that uh, and we can answer that in a little bit more detail if you want to want us to have a, a closer look at um, your scenario but thanks for the question Steve and if you want me to explain that in a little bit more detail again let me know uh, Glenn's got a question here how does the warranty on boats go whilst in charter again that's actually a really good question and an important question because it really poses, um, I guess, the reason why charter companies prefer new boats. And that's because of two reasons. One, the maintenance is far less when the product is, is brand new. And it's got less hours and less wear and tear. But secondly, there is backup warranty support from the manufacturer. And some manufacturers are better than others, but on the whole, uh, you get factory support, particularly with a good... Um, uh, service team or support or importer uh, that brings the boat in for you that uh, should be taken care of. So warranty usually um, usually applies more importantly to uh, the structure of the boat when it comes to the manufacturer of the boat. Uh, but then there's lots of individual warranties around the appliances and, and uh, systems. So engines, for example, have their own manufacturer warranty. Uh, so whether it's a Yamaha outboard or a Volvo or Yenma diesel motor, they have their own warranties that's supported by the manufacturer of those motors. And I think it's often around two years. Uh, and there's other things, water pumps, electronics. Electronics, I think, are up to three years, depending on the manufacturer. Water pumps, um, you know, 12 months. This uh, blanket 12 month warranty on everything that's part of uh, Australian consumer law but um, yeah there's there's uh, certainly uh, good assistance in those first couple of years um, but as the wear and tear creeps up that's probably not so much warranty that's more just general uh, breakages that need to be factored in um, with the cost of ownership uh, Sally's asked a question apart from sea winds what other production cats can you easily get into charter in Australia? Uh, again, that's a really good question, Sally. Partly because um, some boats are, uh, well, let's let's say that Sea Wind, for example, go through the full survey process at the factory, whereas lots of other uh, manufacturers don't actually do the survey process and when i mean survey that's the commercial accreditation program run by amsa 
the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. That is the overall uh, overarching body that manages the, uh, the survey process in Australia. So if you're with the right manufacturer, they will see it from start to finish. Uh, but lots of importers need to take that role on if their manufacturer is basically too big to, um, to give you much time to customise boats because there is quite a bit involved. Um, the whole electrical system needs to be Australian approved. Uh, safety rails need to be the right height. Um, bilge systems, plumbing systems, it's quite extensive. So, and that also goes um, again back to new versus used boats. Uh, be very wary buying a used boat that's not in survey. Even if the boat was once in survey, uh, make sure you do your homework to be sure you can get it back into survey because the rules have changed. And there are um, probably things that you'll have to do to your boat to get it back into, into uh, charter operation. And that's largely um, some safety systems, but uh, uh, still something you have to factor in. Uh, okay. And... Yes, Steve, we'll have the YouTube, uh, the, this presentation up on our multi hull Central YouTube channel. And I believe you'll be sent an email uh, within a couple of hours with a link to the presentation so you can watch it again. Uh, any other questions, guys? No, all good. Okay, folks. Well, listen, thanks again for joining us tonight. I hope that was informative. And um, if I can help you uh, delve in a little deeper and um, explain in a little bit more detail, please don't hesitate to send me an email or, uh, or give me a phone call. Uh, we'll soon also be publishing a book called Sabbaticals which covers this in a bit more detail too. And uh, we'll have that out soon. One more question from Glenn. Uh, what is the average charter contract time and can it be ended within reason? That's actually a really good question, Glenn. Um, typically, most charter companies, at least in the Sundays, will want to see a boat up there for three years or more. It's pretty common that boats will remain in charter for five years but I think three years is the normal minimal uh, period that they sign up, sign boats up to. And to exit charter, you'd normally have to give six months or more notice just so they can start placing bookings on other boats and not um, end up with customers that get distraught when suddenly your boat disappears and they'd had a holiday booked. Uh, so that's, that is a good question there. Um, but in saying that, uh, you know, everyone's pretty reasonable. And if there's a major reason to break the agreement, um, you know, for whatever reason that might be, uh, that comes down to each charter company, but they're all pretty uh, cooperative. It's, it's probably more about the charter companies being in a position to plan forward and, uh, and also, uh, their charter is being um, confident that their holiday is secure when they book it. Okay, any other questions? Happy to hang out for a bit longer, guys. I'm in no hurry, so if there's anything that comes to mind. No? Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much again. We'll leave it there and uh, we'll have a, a video sent out to you shortly. Thanks again.